Hi, everybody. I met a bunch of you this morning, um, but I'm excited to meet the rest of you after this talk. My name is Kit. Um, my pronouns are they, them, or it, its, uh, especially in a language that doesn't support they, them. And I've come here from Berlin today. Uh, actually came in yesterday, and I wanted to share with you some ongoing work and work from the past few years on a body data curriculum. And here I'll talk about it as a project that has been moving from exploring the embodied self through body data to uh, toward a more interconnected societal orga organism perspective. And so what do I mean when I say body data? I'll have a little bit more in-depth information about this later on. But this is something that entails both systematic self-reflection through various digital means, including explicitly explicit use of self-tracking technology. So for example, things like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, things like that, but beyond it as well, as well as implicit, out of sight, perhaps uh, not entirely consensual digital surveillance of the body. All of those things coalesce together into body data. My background is in human-computer interaction, uh, and for the past several years, I've been doing practice-based research on encounters with body data. This has included participatory performance, drawing and movement, and workshops and teaching. In encounters with body data, I'm interested in the sociality and creativity of working with body data, in particular, in order to connect abstract concepts with direct experience. And I, in the previous talk by Mark, I, he said something toward the end that I wanted to quote as a starting point here too, which was, fight it not just in theory, but in everyday life. And so when I say connecting abstract concepts with direct experience, I mean connecting theoretical ideas around body data with a direct experience of embodiment and what it means to be in a body as a person. So this work I've been doing in a variety of different contexts, most recently with the School of Commons at the uh, Zurich University of the Arts in Switzerland. Uh, as a fellow last year working on how do we know what we know about hormones as a primary prov provocation. Uh, and as part of the sort of pedagogical aspects in teaching and workshops, I've also held a few classes at the School of Machines Making and Make Believe in Berlin on radical imperfection and self-tracking in time tracking and upcoming course and complex systems. I've also collaborated with a number of different uh, artists and writers as well as researchers in the area of human computer interaction related to digital health data and self-tracking. So to give you a very quick kind of overview of the types of uh, the range of work that I do. So on this side there's a exquisite corpse exercise that arose organically from the time tracking class at the School of Machines. So each of the participants uh, saw one uh, output of a data visualization and contributed one output. They only saw the previous one. And then as a group, we debriefed the entire set. You'll notice here that they're not extremely self-explanatory, and that was part of the purpose, is that the legibility is not the goal so much as the act of producing a data representation as a mechanism for meditating on that data. So we have some sonification, a sculpture, uh, a digital collage with a photograph, and a few other really interesting renderings that then we then discussed as a group. At the end of last year's residency with the School of Commons, I also uh, held a participatory performance co-presented with two other artists, one of them on, the, uh, on a pipe organ. And together we, uh, in, with the audience, we explored uh, cyclic and rhythmic uh, experiences, so hormonal experiences in the body, by creating a vocal composition in which the pipe organ was also involved. Uh, additionally, last year, along with some researchers in HCI, uh, we held a workshop called Beyond Prediction, Data Reflections from Me to Us, where we looked at the use of digital health data and the expectations of digital health data and kind of questioning some of the assumptions and exploring some of the tensions within that. And so this was in the context of the Weizenbaum Conference for Practicing Sovereignty, meaning digital technologies to support sovereignty, digital sovereignty, and data sovereignty. So I'll come to some of the outcomes from that workshop throughout this talk. So this work has spanned a lot of different types of disciplines, so I'll be drawing on all of those. But before we get into it, I wanted to invite you to uh, do a small exercise. You do not have to do any of the exercises, but if you do, you're welcome to. Uh, and here, uh, I would invite you for a minute to find your heartbeat 
and either tap your fingers with the heartbeat on a surface, or you can make tick marks on a piece of paper, like with the pen and pencil, because I see a, a fair number of people have pen and pencil. So take a moment to find the heartbeat somehow. Sometimes it's the neck, sometimes it's your hand. And then let's start a minute of listening to the heartbeat and making tick marks or tapping it out. And that has been a minute, so you can stop. So after, after this talk, we can have a discussion that perhaps draws in some of the reflections that you have. So I'll invite you to write down anything that kind of came up during that exercise, perhaps also reflecting on when was the last time you manually found your heartbeat? When was the last time it was measured for you? And what was the context of that? whether you noticed that observing it seemed to impact it, whether you were distracted by other people's. So anything that comes up, you can write it down. And in general, I'll have a few reflection questions in here that uh, if you write down things about them, then maybe we can bring it into the discussion afterward. Uh, within the talk today, I wanted to cover several different topics, among them this idea of body data and in particular how it relates to collective sense making as a practice, uh, exploring self-tracking as a mechanism to build body knowledge, some of the tensions that arise there, uh, some of the challenges, but also things that people have done to uh, subvert or overcome those challenges as well as uncertainty and the capacity for betrayal of data, which are some of the topics that the previous uh, talk has also suggested. Um, and lastly, I'll share a few of the interventions, activities, and prompts that I've explored in my practice and, and in this work in progress, the open source curriculum. And this is something that I would really welcome uh, feedback on from you because I think the, the trajectory of this project has dwelled very much in the social, sociality and creativity of body data practices um, still with primarily the outcome of a individual person exploring their embodied experience through data or vice versa. Uh, and I'm actually really interested in creating something that's more of a social tool, so a tool for advocacy and so forth as a next major step of this project. So as another invitation for reflection, I'd like you to find a piece, either a piece of paper or on your phone, start to create a list of sources of data that informs or could inform your understanding of your body. So, and if you want, you can keep this list available and add to it throughout this talk as uh, you kind of remember various data sources. So every time I've done this prompt, it's helpful to have the list available because most of the time, the first three things that come to mind can be greatly extended by, the, by all of the things that you remember later on. So as you kind of continue to add to this list, feel free to um, kind of expand on it at any time. I want to start giving you more of a definition of what I mean by body data. And here I look at body data as something that informs your one's, a person's understanding of their body and how they relate to their body. A big part of this is health data. So this is actually um, this diagram here was something that was created as a result of debriefing the discussion at the workshop at the Weizenbaum conference. So 12 people participated in this workshop, including some folks from a public health background, including folks that have worked with health data in a professional setting, or who had a personal stake at it, all of whom were interested in the general topic of digital or data sovereignty. 
And we discuss, and like part of the discussion about halfway through seemed to really want to define health data. So through the process of making that definition, we kind of came up with this overview. As first, there's like the stuff that you're actively tracking or explicitly opt in, passively tracking. So for example, as part of managing diabetes or tracking fertility. So things that are very much available to, uh, to consumers or to patients within the medicalized setting uh, that include either explicit opt-in or explicit action. There's sort of a more generalized um, a cloud of things that may or may not include explicit opt-in. So for example, step count data that might be collected by a device that is just on you, whether or not you look at it. Um, and then there's, of course, public health data. So this is information that can be made available for research. Um, there's an overlap here, perhaps, of data donation and solidarity of making data available for research purposes with the aim of it aiding scientific or medical progress, depending on the context. Uh, but there's also other non-medical examples of it as well that I'll, uh, that I'll give an example of in a moment. And additionally, there's a fairly large uh, amount of data that is not explicitly collected with the purpose of understanding one's health, but which can be used to interpret health data. So for example, calendars, photos, and so forth. So many different artif digital art trace artifacts. And so one thing to point out is that when we talk about public health, uh, public health data or health data, we talk about fairly structured data sets. But part of the outcome of the ubiquity of AI-related technologies is that structured data, set are, data sets are not strictly speaking necessary in order for that data to be usable or to be used. So uh, as an example of a data set that is not health-related, but that is body data that has been donated in solidarity is one of my favorite projects. I did not make this. I just love this project so much. It's Queering the Map. And uh, you can follow them on social media where they put uh, dots into various locations where certain powerful queer experiences happened. A first kiss, a coming out, uh, seeing a trans person for the first time and recognizing oneself and that experience. So it's a really wonderful project and I think it's an example of a data set. It is a body data set. It is a, a, uh, inextricable from an experience in, as a body. And furthermore, it is something that is shared in solidarity. Other data sets have been constructed by trans and queer people in solidarity. There is a massive number of videos online on YouTube of transition. And this is, these uh, form a vital resource for people who are transitioning uh, in order to kind of see how they react to it, see how they relate to it as part of the community building practice within that community. Uh, but these, of course, can be misused because they are public and they are body data. So uh, this is a fairly old article around transgender YouTubers who had their videos grabbed to train facial recognition software. So what's interesting if you dig into that article is that the original author's intent is to create a more diverse data set and a more inclusive data set that is better at recognizing uh, sort of the intended gender. So there's, there's some positive uh, uh, purposes behind this that are currently very much top of mind. We talk a lot about bias and AI. So this is a great example of the intent was great. And furthermore, they, they actually just compiled list of links to YouTube videos, but that still felt like a breach and a misuse of data shared in solidarity. So I want to quote from an, uh, an article that I think is really wonderful about this by Oz Keys on the misgendering machines. So whether or not automated gender recognition can be made to work in a technically trans-inclusive way does not answer the question of whether that is meaningful. Whatever the approach an AGR system takes for discriminating between genders, however many trans people the data set includes, the technology is fundamentally premised on the idea that gender is something assigned. Yet to be trans, to be of a gender that runs contrary-wise to that which society assumed of you, means to stand as testament to the idea that it is self-knowledge, not external assignation, that has primacy in defining gender. Put simply, a trans-inclusive system for non-consensually defining someone's gender is a contradiction in terms. So when we talk about data donation and solidarity, that is always a risk that regardless of the context or the degree of consent of data donation, which is uh, all, of course, debatable of how much data was donated in solidarity, and that's in that particular example even, 
uh, even if it was public. The use of those aggregate data sets, despite intent, may run counter to the values of some contributors. And this is a problem that we also see with public health data. And with the example that was brought up in the previous talk around uh, NHS data sets. So there's also mechanisms to opt out of that. And then there's all of these other um, communications that the NHS was putting out around uh, typical use of like third party data processors and providers and how important that is and so forth. So there's a great deal of possibility for perceived misuse, for misuse or for a sense of betrayal. So when we talk later about capacity for betrayal, we'll come back to this. But first, I want to talk a little bit about collective sense making, which is kind of the positive aspect of this. Um, I've included a few references to literature and human computer interaction. So if you're interested in this topic, there's some interesting readings there. Uh, but I wanted to kind of create a connection to the movement, uh, the quantified self movement in the 2010s. There's still some people who are into this, but it was really kind of booming at that time. And their use of show and tells or physical gatherings to describe what people tracked, how, what they learned, um, and basically doing collective sense making around the methods, around the sensors, the spreadsheets, and the visualizations that were produced. Meanwhile, over many decades, uh, in online health and well being communities, people bring data about their experiences, so either managing specific uh, health conditions, chiefly diabetes or chronic health conditions of some kind. Um, or general or mental well-being, mental health, with the explicit intent to seek assistance making sense of themselves and their bodily experience with others that they feel they resonate with. These communities collaboratively, collaboratively develop understanding of how bodies work, identifying event triggers for particular conditions, or developing treatment protocols. So this is something that happens that is aided by a diversity of practices that include self-tracking, that include the use of medical data, but that are largely taking place in a discursive online setting. So if you're having your list, uh, if you're keeping up a list or if you're having it available of potential body data sources, I would ask if, oops, if there's one of these that you could think about what kind of support you would need in analyzing this data. So if you were to look at your list of body data sources and there was something in there that was interesting, what sort of help would you like to get? In general, consumer technologies make self-tracking commonplace. The phrase self-tracking is not used by the vast majority of people who are doing self-tracking. So one obvious example would be period tracking, so fertility um, and menstruation trackers, the users of which, if, the, if that's the only type of self-tracking they do, they tend to not call themselves self-trackers. Um, so this term itself, I use it as an umbrella to uh, kind of feed into a lot of this body of, of human computer interaction literature. However, it is often not used by people who are engaging with this type of activity or engaging with this type of data or tool. It's commonplace to the, to the point where I think most people have done some sort of self-tracking without calling it self-tracking or really thinking about it in the, the, those terms at all. Regardless of whether you identify with the term, there are many motivations that are kind of, uh, that are quite common to understand body change over time in a response to behavioral or circumstantial changes, such as like food or exercise, to understand aspects of the body that uh, you only have indirect windows into, which primarily has to do with chronic illness management or chronic condition management, uh, like chronic pain, migraine, irritable bowel, and so forth. Uh, to exert control over the body to achieve a particular shape or form, and to claim ownership over a medical condition which has significantly altered bodily function or experience. And so if you're keeping up a list, in one of a couple of these things, what would be a surprising finding? So if you were to have that data and you were to analyze it, what would be a surprising or interesting finding? And how long would you need to collect data for it to actually be valuable?
It is worth pointing out that most self-tracking projects fail to live up to the hopes and expectations of the people undertaking them. So the vast majority of projects that are started, even with great intent uh, and energy and enthusiasm and momentum, do not go anywhere and usually result in people saying like, oh, I wish I was better at this. It's very similar to journaling in that regard. Um, and there's some, there's some really interesting kind of literature around abandonment um, that is salient here. But one of the things that I've been finding in my own work is that self-tracking renders a person aware of all the ways in which they do not understand their body and cannot control it for either personal, organizational, practical, technological reasons. There are many reasons. So in many ways, this is a, a deeply unsettling and isolating experience. Uh, there's a book by Deborah Lupton, uh, The Quantified Self, and uh, this book is a really interesting kind of summary, in particular, of the quantified self movement of the 2010s. And in, in here, she talks about how the visual images of tracked data may be privileged as a more objective image than the signs offered by the real or fleshly body. As part of the project of seeking security and stability, these technologies attempt to penetrate the dark interior of the body and to render it visible, knowable, and thereby it is assumed manageable. In terms of duration and managing, I wanted to share this visualization of uh, three decades of continuous wrist activity uh, recording analysis of sleep duration by uh, an, a number of authors, but it was the first author uh, who wore this, the, the activity tracker to manage the sleep. Uh, you'll see here, for example, there's like a little S-shaped thing that denotes jet lag without, uh, not jet lag, but like time zone difference without it being accounted for in the tracker since it's 1995. And this was from a lab that was developing wearable activity measurements. So this is a researcher who was very much in the context of developing this technology. So very few people ultimately generate data sets of the type of duration that would allow them to look back and look at like major life changes. And here, this article is a short article where the first author reflects on how retirement from academia had impacted his sleep patterns. Uh, which was, it's a very interesting article and it includes the phrase aware of the finitude of life uh, as a motivation for why to publish this article now. And I think it's one of those things that really points out that like very few people end up sticking to projects or having motivations that allow them to stick to projects as well as having the means to stick to the project and the kind of legitimacy of sharing that work because who of us can write an article in the European Sleep Research Society about our Fitbit data. So I think that there's something here also around who is doing self-tracking and why. No matter who, who you are or what you're doing, it, there are many uncertainty, sources of uncertainty when it comes to wearable devices. And in many ways, this can also um, translate to other types of tools for self-tracking. We can kind of separate these into input uncertainty. Difficult to know whether the data coming in is from a system that is sufficiently accurate to produce meaningful outputs, where meaningful is defined in relation to the user's needs. So for example, do I trust my sleep tracking? Let's for a moment reflect again on the, on the heartbeat exercise. So we were measuring our heartbeat and tapping it out. There's also many tools to measure the, to the heartbeat. So there's uh, pulse tools that now you can use like light to your skin. Depending on different kinds of reports, there's anecdotal and research evidence that these tools work worse on darker skin. So in terms of input uncertainty, that would be one type. In terms of output uncertainty, many users of activity trackers struggle to understand whether the readings are normal, exceptional, or worrying. This is the so what. Almost every activity tracker outputs something that's like a line like this, and you just don't know what to do with that. Uh, a big reason for that is that activity tracking becomes interesting after years or decades of use, not after days. So it is very hard to make an app that like sells well, <laughs> that allows people to like do something on the scale of days, because that's just not the scale of behavior change that people are interested in. And lastly, there's functional uncertainty. Our users are unable to understand how, why, and by whom the data is being used, including concerns about privacy 
and security. So we're back to capacity for betrayal. So body data of various sorts has the capacity to betray in many different ways. The results can be hard to interpret or to act on despite a lot of invested effort. So some examples of specific betrayals would be fertility and menstruation tracking when access to abortion is restricted. So at that point, it becomes compl complicated of who is taking care, like, is it possible to uh, have, for example, be forced to help hand over that data as part of an investigation of whether or not uh, an illegal abortion has been performed? And that becomes now a policy question. It becomes now not a question of how good is the tracker or how good is the app, but rather how good are the protections around that data. And, and there's employers setting goals for health metrics, such as blood pressure, that impact health insurance payments and other types of uh, integration between self-tracking and insurance companies. This particular example is from the Weapons of Mass Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, and there's a lot of more contemporary work around this um, that you can look up if you're interested. But this is why the collective sense, sense making that we, that we do, so this is already something that happens, but a big thrust of the work that I'm interested in is to extend the collective sense making practice beyond methods and body understanding to include broader socio technical challenges. So all of these things cannot be grouped under there are uncertainties around wearables and we have to overcome them technically because these are not fundamentally technically or strictly technically technical mm -hmm. problems. These are either societal, political, policy, or socio-technical problems. And it is up to consumers to figure out how to engage with those in order to support more productive advocacy. So the last question for the list of data, data sources, what worries you? This can be anything. It can be on the meta level or not. And returning to the first invitation, which was to find the heartbeat <coughs> and to tap the, fin the fingers. And here, if you like, you can make a louder tapping noise and see, and see kind of what, social what sociality arises from kind of the conflict. So we'll take, we'll take just a minute, find the heartbeat, get ready, and go. And that is one minute. I will share with you a excerpt from an essay that was recently published in the Post Humanist magazine, uh, where I reflect on having done this exercise for, at first online many times. So I would open sessions with this, with the heartbeat exercise, and then I started to bring it into a physical space. 
Over the last couple of years, I had opened a few sessions online with an exercise. Make a tick mark every time your heart beats. It is a good exercise to tune into your body and to start a discussion about using drawing to build body knowledge. When I finally used this exercise in person, after a year, a year of doing it over video, call, video calls, I noticed that the pens and pencils against paper make a chorus. The chorus longs for a rhythm that is both inescapable and unattainable. As they make tick marks, people become drawn to the signs of others or distracted by them. They try to either match or overpower what they hear outside the body with what is arising inside the body. When you observe your heartbeat, you can also change it. Maybe not much, but certainly a little bit. Maybe even a little bit more with practice. As the group is making tick marks, tuck, 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 inevitably some people will start to draw their heartbeats into a matching rhythm. Two people with pencils and chorus, but who have picked a different moment in their circulatory beat for tick mark making, are making a different song with their hearts. One of the reasons that I really enjoy this exercise is that, first of all, it came from a book of col uh, collect, uh, Observe, Collect, Draw uh, by, Lu by Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Pasavich, which is specifically around using drawing and uh, self-tracking uh, self as a method for experiencing uh, of like body experience, but that book is very individual. So it's very much like around individual people observing their individual experience. So it's very interesting to bring this exercise into uh, realm, the realm of sociality. Furthermore, the idea of tuning into your heartbeat has been used in a lot of research as a measure of interoceptive awareness or awareness of, uh, that we have of what's happening inside the body. Interoception as a sense of kind of how you interpret your signals. So a simple question of how do you know that you need to go to the bathroom? And so the list of things that you listen for, that's interoception. And having a disruptive, some sort of disruption in interoceptive awareness is around like either not noticing the signals or not interpreting them or not regulating them appropriately by taking action. And one of the measures that is used is how well a person can notice their own heartbeat with their own kind of mechanisms that are available to them without, uh, without technological aid. Regardless of how much practice you have, it doesn't take much practice to start to change your heartbeat through ob observing it, which is more or less the story with all self-tracking, self is that the moment you do anything explicitly, you also change what is actually happening. In which case, if your desire of self-tracking is to create a, some sort of discovery of an organism that is observed, that is your organism, it is not possible because you are changing it by undertaking the project. So this image uh, that, that I show here has these tick marks. So this is actually a tracing from a particular session that I did with the School of Commons. And th these are the heartbeats of that particular participant. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first part of this talk where I kind of talked through the body data, self-tracking, as well as the capacity for betrayal entailed in that data. So now I'm going to share a few of the interventions and activities and prompts that I've used. And I'll start with a quick overview of some research that actually Marisa and I did together on the mechanisms of subversion and resistance of the instrumented body. So we've uh, written two articles, one in ex-coax, one that was published in the Politics of Machines Berlin, uh, where we looked at kind of contemporary art practices and various artists working with body data uh, in order to kind of like resist or subvert some of the uh, some of the topics that they were specifically working with, as well as body uh, instrumentation, body observation in general. What we found in the first uh, set of work that we did was the self-tracking frustration can highlight a par paradox of control. So the motivation for self-tracking can include gaining control, oh, such as uh, reducing or eliminating uncertainty, truthfully observing a body experience, or directing behavior change, and methods for self-tracking entail losing control. There are now new sources of uncertainty. There's an appearance of objective data that disconnects from the subjective experience, and behaviors are influenced in unintended ways. And so it's possible to potentially use this frustration to kind of create an additional discourse on top of that to explore these subjects in greater depth, especially within a community setting. And another, uh, in another article, we were working on uh, looking at examples from contemporary art to inform how to actually 
undertake subversion or resistance of the instrumented body. And kind of the three themes that we found was building on existing knowledge that includes an awareness of institutional and structural dynamics, so not just health or body knowledge. Uh, integrate and contextualize through narrative and embodied experience, so really focusing on narrative rather than the legibility of individual data visualizations, for example. As well as a do it with others uh, perspective, a do it with others ethos of activity, of collective care and exploration rather than individual optimization. So within some of the previous work that we did, we also drew on uh, some, and this really nice article from Rebecca Sanders on how to kind of appropriate self-tracking technologies for subversive date body projects. And here she's talking about typical consumer technologies and they're used by non-artists, just consumers in general, looking instead of emphasis on self-knowledge through numbers to discover on the authentic self that has always already existed, Treat digital self-tracking devices not as means of self-discovery, but as tools for inventing oneself as something new and not yet imagined. Instead of body projects that define progress, success, and satisfaction in terms of exterior form of the body, counter, uh, embrace counter-normative and more liberating digital body projects would be uh, purposefully goal-unoriented. And instead of game design elements, which in practice do not make self-tracking endeavors truly fun, playful, or pleasurable, focusing on the quality of one's interior experience, thereby adopting a counter-normative way of ex experiencing the body and evaluating how one feels. So these are principles that, we, that I've brought in also to other workshops and lectures for just generalized and commonplace encounter with very simple data sets. So the sleeping, step, step tracking, so si simple things, not necessarily um, artwork per se. But there's also really powerful artwork examples that Marisa and I have brought into both of those articles. And I'm only going to mention one of them that I think is a really, really inspiring. So Mary Magic's open source estrogen, which combines a do-it-yourself science, body and gender politics and ecological ramifications of the, uh, of the present. Um, and Magic <sighs> describes self-synthesized hormone therapy as a form of biotechnical civil disobedience uh, developed in response to the various microbiopolitics of hormonal control in female and trans bodies prescribed by governments and institutions. At the, core of, at the core of this form of disobedience is the demystification of science, the way it is performed, politicized, and marketed to the masses. Through do it yourself or do it with others, in biology, in artistic practice, we can provide greater transparency to the black boxes of science and democratize the tools and knowledge produced. So particularly with the subject of hormone monitoring, hormone therapy, um, and the way that people encounter and interpret their bodily hormonal experience, there's a lot of really interesting projects that exist that go far beyond kind of interpretation of readily available to consumer technologies to also much more the space of biohacking. In my own workshops, I've really worked, on, worked with uh, drawing and with image making, also image making uh, with creative coding technologies like P5JS. So these are just some examples uh, from prior sessions. So the list that I asked you to make of uh, the data inventory and the data archaeology, so look at your data sources and then look in the past. Um, this is one possible layout for it. You've got the little heartbeat here, and then you have the uh, historical data sets, current data sets, and what you can do with them. So it's, a, it's a, a layout that helps people journal through their kind of data inventory. Um, there's some practices that I've brought into, for example, the Weizenbaum conference, where uh, this was not a space of drawing and of playing around with markers, but we made it into a space of drawing and of playing around with markers by folding up some transparency making lines, making these timelines, these accordion timelines that would unfold and unfurl to reveal greater depth of data availability. So it created this more tactile um, component that was really surprising in the context where it was presented. Um, and lastly, this is an example of an output from a P5.js sketch, which is a, a JavaScript tool for web-based uh, creative coding and interactive creative coding where the idea here is to create abstract glyphs as a practice of working with, with one's data. This was in context of P5JS workshops, um, where the abstraction centers the process of sense making rather than legibility. So there's no, there's no legend for this, and it doesn't matter, and that's the point. Um, this is an example of something that I, that I did to demonstrate the idea of glyphs that was a drawing um, looking at a particular process of glyph making um, that I included in those workshops. 
That particular body of work with P5JS has also been included in the Critical Coding Cookbook um, as a small number of P5JS sketches, as well as a number of prompts. The prompts that are included in there will be very familiar to you from the data inventory that like, list your data sources and reflect on them. And the main goal here is to provide some playful tools for drawing, for talking about data with people who may, who are without necess necessitating somebody to be a quote unquote expert in any of the related fields. Uh, a driving force be behind those is to incorporate different principles or different um, frameworks that have been developed by people working in this area. Uh, I found the principles of data feminism. So this, this book is also available online for free um, to basically activate those principles when we work with our own data. So I've also, as part of the critical coding cookbook contribution, there's sort of a breakdown of how each of the, se of the seven principles can apply to working with one's data as a conversational prompt, as a discursive prompt, as a way to articulate our experience with data. Because when we look at our experience with data, it is isolating, it is not really something we talk about unless something has gone terribly wrong, in which case there's a degree of profound doubt um, or uncertainty. And so in that sense, the purpose of all this is to create language and to provide um, to, like discursive tools for, that people can draw on that aren't rooted in, oh, everything is wrong, everything is broken, I don't know what happened, I need, uh, like, I need help to understand this, but rather as also a, cre a creative practice and a practice of collective curiosity. The purpose of that, again, is to allow us greater empowerment with respect to the capacity for betrayal of all the different types of health data and body data more generally. So collective sense making must extend beyond methods for, uh, and, and body understanding to include broader socio-technical challenges, including the tensions between the desire for a good user experience and the need for transparency and empowerment. One of the themes that came up in this conversation, even within the conference of the Weizenbaum conference, was really um, around the desire for a smooth experience or people were talking about uh, various frustrations that they had experienced with self-tracking. But some of those first first frustrations are technical and design in nature. And some of those frustrations arise directly from the fact that seamful data integration is sometimes necessitated by good data practices. And so the question becomes, does this have to be attention? And what socio-technical ch uh, changes need to happen in order for this to not be attention? And for consumers generally, for anybody who is engaging with body data, which is anybody, to engage in that conversation, it is important to have access to the tools, the frameworks, and the sense that they can participate in that conversation, um, from diff like, regardless of what their kind of initial background is. Next, I would like to share with you a project. Um, that was developed together with uh, artist Ellie Clark. And here, I'm gonna see if I can do this. So this is a, all right. So here's a website. It asks, what do you feel? Do I have any volunteers who want to say what they feel? And I promise I will type that in. Disquiet. Okay. You know me. You trust me. I'm going to type disquiet in here. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> What's happening? Um, so the idea. So in this in this particular thing, anything that you type will continue to bring up other other people's response that they have put in in other contexts. So that's what's happening. So I feel so many feelings. <laughs> because this is the choice-free survey instrument. Your well-being is of my utmost concern. You have encountered 6% of all feelings. The, the dirty data handled in the creation of this choice-free survey instrument was extracted out of the mouths and typing bodies of audiences from nine participatory performances by Sargina and her agents that took place between 2019 and 2021. Of these, 100 unique duplicates removed, fleshy of at least three words, feelings are randomly fed back to you for you to lap up. 
This was part of uh, the dirty data dissemination by Sergina, a border straddling multi body drag queen who uses data gathered for, from, from her audiences to create performances about love, lust, and loneliness. And so here we see some data for sale. We've got some printouts. What's on the printouts? The printouts contain uh, the, out, the output that people put, it, the output of uh, surveys that people submitted in those different performances. So you saw one aspect of that in the choice-free survey instrument where it was like particularly some cleaned, typed in, what do you feel responses, but there were many other questions on those surveys. And all the responses were pulled together and were out, output onto these prints in various stages of cleaning. So we sorted them, we uh, identified their sentiment, how positive or negative they were, and we printed them out. It was a medi part, of, part of that project was to think about dirty data and about data cleaning, uh, which is actually one of the interesting, really interesting themes that comes up in the data feminism principles and something that is often intentionally hidden from view from the uh, end users of most data-driven technologies. That certain data assumptions remain consistent in popular articulation about the need for tidiness, cleanliness, and order. Data scientists might be, must be able to tame the chaos, must scrub and cleanse dirty data, you know, data. But what might be lost in the process of dominating and disciplining data? What perspectives might be lost in that process? And conversely, whose perspectives might be additionally imposed? In the previous talk, we talked about AI data sets. And in many ways, AI data, data sets are homogenized partly through the process of cleaning and of rendering that data set articulable to on a technical level. In this process, certain perspectives, marginalized perspectives, are further marginalized, and additional perspectives are reinforced and uh, additionally imposed. And the assumed values of cleanliness and control over messiness and complexity are not requirements nor the goals of all data projects. So this is one of the provocations from the authors of Data Feminism. Uh, that I think really ties well into the goal, this idea of the subversive data project. So what are the goals of body data projects? To reinvent oneself, to be purposely goal unoriented, and to focus on the quality of one's interior experience. Among these other, so these drawings uh, that I've shown before also contain these heartbeats, but the, the vaguely human shaped drawings here uh, the, uh, the outputs of a body map exercise. It's a drawing exercise, so it's people drawing with their eyes closed during something like a body scan exercise. So their eyes are closed, and I start to narrate. Okay, now we're, now we're uh, looking at the, like, draw your attention to your eyes, to your nose, to your mouth. Then we go into the gross kind of musculoskeletal features, the shoulders, the shoulder blades, the elbow, the wrist, now draw the other hand, and everybody remembers that there's another hand. And then we go internally, we go into the viscera. We know where the heart is, but when we get to some of the lesser, lesser established organs, there's of course a bit of a confusion of where is the spleen? We're not like 100%, there's like stuff in there. Um, and then one of the things that we did in this, this is part of the um, performance at the School of Commons, one of the things we did was we did the broken telephone version of this, where after I did the body scan, I asked for volunteers from the audience to stand up and do the body scan. So they made other choices on which body parts they dwelled on. There was one here, I think there's a big, yeah. So there was a, and there's a foot. So there was a, one person who really dwelled on the toes for a while. <laughs> there was a lot of toe thinking. And that was a really wonderful, playful way to not be goal-oriented, to not be problem-solution-oriented with regard to imagining the body, uh, but rather to realize how much is going on in there that you can just think about on a more playful or curious level. And so that fed into this kind of vocal composition that we did thereafter about hormones. One of the things that I, this was not the intended output of that project when I started. When I started, I wanted to do something uh, a little bit more interview based around hormones, but what I found was that there's basically two types of experiences with hormones, which is, which is I don't know, I don't think about them, or 
I think about them and it's like super hard and super bad and everything is broken. Um, and there's the, the middle ground is fairly narrow. So people either are not really connected with that aspect of their, their experience or it's actually a source of great difficulty, which is why we went in a, like I went in a much more abstract direction in terms of creating the capacity for collective curiosity that then maybe arises to my, some conversation but starts out somewhere else besides the profound difficulty of either con lack of control of one's own body or a lack of control of the observation of one's body because the moment we get into the capacity for betrayal or into digital surveillance, it is hard and it is alarming and alienating in its own right. So what I'm interested in moving forward, what I'm working on now is the idea of putting together an open source curriculum where uh, other people can also contribute their experiences, their um, reflections, their in individual modules uh, with the primary goal of like putting together different modalities that are related to data health or embodiment within other practices. So I've used drawing, movement, some of these journaling prompts and so forth, and I want to connect with other people who have also done those things and to kind of draw them together into a repository that can help um, create like little lesson plans. And this is just a sketch related to mine, um, but I think it's something that's very malleable at the moment. Uh, using a combination of like open calls and like technology that people can directly contribute to, though I think that, that it's important for there to be different mechanisms of contribution, with the ultimate goal of improving at like the capacity for advocacy and empowerment. So right now, the previous, all of the previous examples have really focused on creating a particular space in a particular group or in a particular session, um, and there's been some really interesting outcomes from that work. But moving forward, I think figuring out a way to share that work more systematically um, is, is the aim. So uh, that's part of the thing that like, I'm very, very curious what your reactions are, what your, what your suggestions or questions would be about it. And so to wrap up what we've talked about today, uh, I talked a lot about the idea of body data as combining both systematic self-reflection and digital surveillance. I talked from a perspective of practice-based research that included many different um, like disciplines and modalities. And I'm particularly interested in encounters with body data that use sociality and creativity to connect the abstract concepts with direct experience. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'm very, very happy to take questions. And or for the next half hour or however long we have left, uh, we can also look into the thoughts that came up for you during the various invitations. So if you have something that you wrote down that you would like to bring to the group for us to discuss together, I would be delighted to do that. So thanks. <laughs>